If you don't know me, my name's Ez. I'm one of the ministers here at St. Luke's. Uh, could you please keep your Bible open to Jonah 4? We're going to go through that together right now. Uh, sometime this week, uh, one of my children uh, was throwing a massive tantrum. I don't even know which kid it was now, and I don't even know what it's about. Uh, maybe something about the temperature of the food, or he or she couldn't get up the chair, or just tiredness or something. But this tantrum went on for a while, so I was quite fed up with it after a while, and I began to yell, and I yelled things like, why are you like this? Why are you always like this? What have I done to you? What an ungrateful kid. And that's when I realized, to my shame, I was throwing a tantrum too now. <laughs> Didn't really help, did it? You see, it's not just children that... that have hissy fits, is it? Adults aren't immune to them either. In fact, it's even uglier to see it from an adult. We're supposed to be more grown up, we're supposed to have more self-control, but really, when it comes out, it does, because it is really just a symptom of an ungrateful heart. This morning, we see a hissy fit of biblical proportions. And it is not pretty. In case you don't remember what's happened over the last few weeks, let me bring you up to speed. God has told Jonah at the very start of the book of Jonah, take this message to the great city of Nineveh. Preach against them. And Jonah says, I don't want to. I'm going to run the other way. He tries to run away from God on a boat. But he soon finds out that there is nowhere on earth, on land or on sea, that he can run far enough from God where he is not there. And when it looks like Jonah is about to get what he deserves as he's thrown overboard off the boat to certain death, God provides a fish to save him. And out of that near-death experience, out of the belly of that fish, he's reborn with renewed hope. He becomes a new man. He prays this beautiful prayer to God that we find in chapter 2. Salvation comes from the Lord. It's like he's a new person. And so once again, God tells him, take my message to Nineveh. This time, Jonah obeys. Forty more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. That's his message. And as he walks through the city, taking this message to the people of Nineveh, we see perhaps one of the most amazing miracles in the Old Testament. The people listen. The people repent. The people turn to God. In fact, everyone repents. From the kings and the nobles to the lowest castle of Nineveh, everyone turns away from their wickedness. It's it's a massive, massive event. It's a revival of the city, which I think makes Jonah arguably the most successful prophet in the Old Testament. I don't know if you've ever thought of him that way, but no other prophet has been able to do this kind of thing. And he's a reluctant prophet. Wow. Especially if you know who the Ninevites are. You see, the Ninevites aren't just people you expect to turn to God. If you read other parts of the Bible about who these people are, you will know that they are horrific, horrific people. They're not a nice people group. ISIS or Boko Haram have nothing on these guys. War crime is their middle name. Genocide is their game. They were the enemy of God's people. In soon, in a few years' time, they would eventually wipe out Jonah's people, the northern kingdom of Israel. It's because of them that half the kingdom of Israel were destroyed. But these worst of sinners, at this point, on hearing Jonah's message, they turn from their evil ways, and so the Lord turns from his anger. It's a great story, isn't it? What I would give to see what Jonah saw that day. 120,000 people turning to Jesus. Wouldn't that be amazing to see? Why didn't that happen over Christmas here at St. Luke's? You know, over Christmas we have had wonderful news of, of at least half a dozen people say they decided to follow Jesus that day. That's wonderful, isn't it? To see God save the lost 
through us. We're still trying to follow them up, actually, uh, trying to set them up to follow Jesus for the rest of their life. But what I wouldn't give to see 120,000 people put down on that sheet, sheet of paper, I have decided to follow Jesus today. That's what Jonah saw that day. And yet, the story of Jonah isn't over. You know, the book of Jonah is very popular in children's Bibles. If you've ever flicked open to one, I'm sure you've seen a great big fish in there before. It's a pretty interesting part of the story, that fish. But correct me if I'm wrong, I've never seen chapter 4 feature in a kid's Bible. Please tell me if you found a child's Bible that has that. Bring that to me. I'd love to see that. But at most, I've seen some children's Bibles go all the way to the Ninevites repenting and God relenting from calamity. But I've never seen chapter 4 in a children's Bible. Because in a lot of ways, I think chapter 3 kind of ends it. It's, it's kind of like a finale already. We, we reach chapter 3, verse 10, and this is what it says. When God saw what the Ninevites did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. That seems like a nice neat ending. But no, we have chapter 4, because God's work isn't done yet. God has already saved a city of sinners, and now it's time for him to save Jonah. Because the book of Jonah isn't just about God's power to save even the most wicked sinners. Jonah isn't even about God's ability to work despite the reluctance of his people. Jonah, as a book is about God's compassion, his compassion that penetrates even the most hardened, self-righteous heart. That's what Jonah is about. And we see in chapter 4, God get down on Jonah's level, bend down to serve this prophet. Because Jonah's struggling at the start of chapter 4 with what God has done for Nineveh. We read from verse 1, but to Jonah... This seemed very wrong. What God did, wrong, unjust, evil. He became angry. He prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, Take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? That's a hissy fit. And we're finally told why Jonah ran away that first time. It wasn't because he was afraid of the Ninevites, of what the Ninevites would do to him if he preached this word. That wasn't his reason. It wasn't even that he didn't think God would be able to follow through on anything and he hasn't got the power and sovereignty over Nineveh. That's not his reason. The reason for his disobedience was because he knew precisely what God was going to do. Be gracious. He knew that our God is a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. You know, it takes a really special person to, to take a beautiful truth about God and warp it. That's what he's done here. This year, St. Luke's Liverpool, we were part of a mission to take John 3.16 to the people of the Georges River region. In case you don't know John 3.16 already, you'll know it very, very well by the end of the year. Here it is on the screen. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now, imagine taking John 3.16 and saying, okay, I know that, I know that's true, that God can save anyone who puts their trust in Jesus. You know what? I don't think the Chinese in Hurstfield deserve to believe in him. I don't think the Lebanese in Bankstown deserve to escape judgment. I don't believe that the Muslims or Hindus or the Buddhists in Liverpool deserve eternal life. That would be heartless, right? Well, that's what Jonah did. He took a beautiful truth about God, which is the Old Testament version of John 3.16, really. It's all over the Old Testament. 
Exodus 34, our Lord is slow to anger, abounding in compassion. And he turns it into a reason for his disobedience. What a guy. Even a reason to be angry at God. God, why would you even think about showing mercy to the people who are oppressing us? To the people who will one day destroy us? Why would you do that? That is wrong, God. I have every right to be angry at you, God. He'd rather die than see God forgiving the Ninevites. Now, when it comes to thinking about people who shouldn't receive God's mercy, I wonder if you have anyone in mind. You might not pray it like Jonah did. You might not say, God, don't save that person. That person doesn't deserve it. But I think the way we treat these people, the way we share the gospel or don't share the gospel to these people, say exactly what Jonah says out loud, but in our hearts. One of my friends, he was abused by his father throughout his childhood. His father made him feel little. He tore him down as a person even before he had a chance to grow up. Even decades later, my friend still carries the scars of his father's hatred and negligence. And this experience has distorted how he trusts people, how he views himself. And it continues to play this horrible part in my friend's narrative today. And I continue to mourn with him over the permanent damage that his father has inflicted on him. And I can't help but be angry at this man. How could he do such a thing? And to think that this man, now that he trusts in Christ, could and will receive the same mercy in Jesus as us, that he might enter heaven's doors holy and blameless, dressed in white, pure, forgiven of all his sins by the blood of our Lord Jesus. And that on the final day, my Lord will say to him, well done, good and faithful servant. Come and share your master's happiness. Just thinking about that makes my blood boil. I wonder if there's anyone for whom you have these feelings toward. Perhaps it's someone who's hurt you deeply, betrayed you. Maybe it's someone you swore that you would never be able to forgive. Someone that you'd like to see get what they deserve on that last day. I'm sure you're not alone. Maybe I'm just a horrible person but I'm pretty sure I'm not alone. I'm guessing that's how a lot of Kenyan Christians feel this week about the terror group, Al-Shabaab, who just murdered three Christian teachers on Monday. I'm guessing that's how many of our brothers and sisters in Nigeria feel about Boko Haram, who just executed 10 of our people on video for the world to see on Christmas Day. And I'm guessing that when the day of persecution comes for us, we will also be tempted to feel the same hatred for our enemies, those who persecute us, as Jonah did. Now, if we're ever to have any hope of loving our enemies as Jesus did, I think we need to see what God taught Jonah as he hoped for judgment to fall on his enemies. And as he teaches this prophet who's throwing a tantrum, this lesson, we see here, even here, God being compassionate. He doesn't just fob Jonah off. He bends down low to serve Jonah. And his compassion that Jonah hates so much shines through as he slows down for Jonah in the form of this real-life parable. Take a look at um, this parable with me from verse 5. 
This is what Jonah experiences. Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. Maybe he's still wondering if God is going to bring down judgment for them. Uh, Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head, to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plants. Maybe the first time in Jonah that he's been happy, actually. But at dawn, the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? And with that, Jonah's story ends. We don't get to see how Jonah responds to God's lesson for him. But presumably, he realizes what he's thought the darkness of his heart, and that's why this is preserved for us, so that we might not make the same mistake. But the lack of an ending does something important for us. It's as if to say to us, the readers now, do you understand? Do you get God's compassion? Do you really understand how much God has concern? for people, for the lost. The power of the story of Jonah is that it holds a mirror to our own hearts. It challenges the Jonah within all of us. We might intellectually assent to core Christian doctrines like like grace alone. That's a wonderful doctrine to believe in. We might truly believe that we are saved as God's people by His mercy, by His pure, undeserved forgiveness, that we could have done nothing to deserve his love, and we can still do nothing, even now, to deserve his love. That only Jesus' sacrifice on the cross makes us right with God. We might believe that, we might assent to that intellectually. But really, Jonah's story shows us that repentance can be complicated. You know, we might have turned to Christ some point in the past. We might know that we are saved by grace alone, but there are still corners in our hearts yet to be touched by the light of the gospel. And unfortunately, we see the symptoms of Jonah's syndrome by the way we take the gospel to other people and by the way we don't take the gospel to other people. We're fickle people, aren't we? We can appreciate God's forgiveness one moment, but then refuse to share it the next. We can be crying out loud, singing in church, salvation comes from the Lord. But on the other days of the week, we can neglect to proclaim this life-giving word to the world. Now, our self-righteousness leads us to see ourselves as, as better than the sinners God has put around us. We don't bother to go to them. We might even be angry at God by the people who he tries to save, who he saves. One moment we're praying, thank you to God for your mercy to me. Next time we're thinking God has, hasn't a clue of what he's doing. Jesus' command to love your enemies somehow doesn't seem to be our agenda sometimes. Even though that's what God has done for us in Christ, right? At just the right time, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so we're happy for people to be brought to justice. That's what we want, justice. 
while accepting forgiveness and grace for ourselves. We have double standards. And we have a value system so distorted that we hesitate in joining God's mission to save the lost. We continually value other things more than the salvation of people. You see it in your own life, don't you? The welfare of our family, a good thing, but overriding the call of the gospel. The contents of our home, the security of our job, our hobbies, the way we entertain ourselves, our own plans for the future, the comfort we enjoy, all that overrides the gospel somehow. I don't think it's too far to say that we are addicted to comfort. We like being comfortable, don't we? We love comfort. Most of what we do in life is just to try to make ourselves just that little bit more comfortable. And you know what? That makes us not evangelize because we don't want to make people feel uncomfortable. We don't want to make ourselves uncomfortable. We think somehow we can evangelize without it being awkward. Well, guess what? Evangelism has to be awkward. We are calling people to turn back to a God they have ignored. And if they don't, they will suffer his eternal judgment. Of course that's going to be awkward. There's no way around that. But yet, we want to comfortably just say a bit of the word, enough so that they're interested. We conform the gospel to the culture of our world. We let our addiction to our own comfort stop us from going to the nations. While God is slow to anger, we are slow to go. The sad fact is that God has always been more committed to reaching the world than his own people have ever been. But in all this, in all our failures, in all our reluctance, and in all the ways we let God down, amazingly, God still shows compassion to us. That's the brilliance of Jonah 4. Even as he sees the ugliness of Jonah's heart, our heart, he doesn't dismiss us, he doesn't fob us off, he doesn't reject us, he doesn't demote us, he doesn't strip us of our calling. In the book of Jonah, we see a God who is patient and kind, a God who wants the ungodly, the wicked, the pagan, the reluctant to all turn to him. We see this in the New Testament, 2 Peter chapter 3. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And the thing is, he doesn't just want everyone to know him. He wants even the people who, to, who know him already to, to know him deeply, to adopt his values, to, to take on his attitude to people, to share his compassion even when we've lost our own way. You see, God's compassion is completely unconditional. We are no better than the Ninevites. That's the truth that we've got to embrace. We were just as lost as they were. None of us deserve God's mercy, not one bit. And unless we understand that, until we believe that with all our heart, we will never be able to show the same compassion to others that he's shown us. And so my prayer is that God might put in us a new heart, a heart that, that mirrors his heart, a heart that shares his concern for the lost. Will you pray with me? Please bow your heads with me. Father God, we praise you that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love a God who relents from sending calamity. You have every right to destroy us, us who have sinned against you as your enemies. But instead, you've given us what we don't deserve. You've lavished on us mercy and forgiveness through your son's death. You've turned your anger away from us. And for that, we are eternally grateful. Father, please 
put in us hearts of compassion. Give us the same concern for the great city of Sydney as you do. And give us strength to love our enemies. Use us so that those around us who've lost their way might come home to you. We ask this in our merciful Lord Jesus' name. Amen.